Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first ever Latino Google Plus Hangout on Air. I'm Elian Ramos, Yardi Gares on Twitter, and I'm the Vice Chair of Communications and PR for Latism, Latinos in Social Media. And we are live from the Google offices in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much to Google for welcoming us into their offices. Uh, this will be the first Hangout ever to be organized by a Latino organization. And this is the first in a series of live stream events that we're going to be having throughout the year, talking about different Latino issues um, that are of, of importance right now. With me at the studio is Chile Aguilar. You might want to follow her on Twitter, because we're going to be following the conversation that happens simultaneously with these chats on Twitter. So if you submit a question during the live stream, we may even give you a shout out. Um, so we'll have a video of this broadcast once it's over. It's going to be on the Latin National YouTube account. And I'll be sending the link out um, on Twitter and, and everywhere else once we are done. Um, so tonight's discussion is part of our efforts as partners of the Yais Ora campaign. And we want to bring light to the importance of the Latino vote, um, certainly this year and, and also beyond uh, We're lucky to have with us the top medium and civic organizations, uh, all of which do extraordinary work to encourage political and civil participation in the Latino community. Um, so with us, we have um, Liliana Rañón from who is the Director of Policy and Legislation for the League of United Latin American Citizens, LULAC. And that's the nation's oldest and largest Hispanic grassroots civic organization. Uh, we also have with us Clarissa Martinez de Castro, who is the Director of Civic Engagement and Immigration at the National Council for La Raza, NCLR. And that's the largest Latino civil rights organization in the U.S. Uh, also in our panel is Leo Pearson, who is a public sociologist and a faculty member of the Department of Humanities and Sciences at Cincinnati U. Uh, he's also a blogger at Huffington Post Latino Voices and a civil rights advocate. And joining us as well is Ilia Calderon, a Hi. of Noticiero Univision Edición Mexicana at the Univision Network which is one of the top five networks in the U.S. regardless of language. Ilya is a Colombian journalist and newscaster with a long career covering Latino issues. She is formerly a Colancora Primer Impacto, which was one of the highest rated news programs in the U.S. and in Latin America. Still is. Uh, and um, last but not least, we have Arturo Vargas, who is the executive director of the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials, which is NALEO, a national membership organization of Latino policymakers and their supporters working to strengthen American democracy. So welcome to all of you. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Today we're going to be discussing the many factors that influence the Latino voice, the Latino votes and the need for raising the Latino engagement in the electoral process in this country. So let's take a, a brief look back. I'm going to be reading some of the, the startling numbers um, in terms of the increase in Latino participation here. In spite of the low registration numbers, the Latino political participation in the last two decades has actually increased, and most notably in the last two elections. Um, in fact, according to census data, in 2004, there were 7.6 million Latino voters, and in 2008, that number rose to 9.75 million, so it's an increase of 28.4%. Um, and according to the Hispanic Center, 14% of those were young voters. Um, so all the projections this year for the elections uh, are indicating that in a tight race, the Latino voters could be the margin of victory in 12 of the 15 swing states. Um, so now that what we have, are seeing here is that Latino voting and influence is actually in a, on an upward trend. And with the 
you know, with a electoral body of like almost growing in unexpected places, even like Virginia and North Carolina. So um, now that we have heard all these numbers, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, and this is an open question to the whole panel. In your experience working and talking to Latinos around the country, what are the, the trends that you are noticing and what are some of the primary concerns that Latinos have during this election year? Um, can I start? Yeah. In, our, in our experience is, um, first of all, economics. Uh, if, we, if we see that most of our voters, of course, a voter is a citizen, immigration becomes more like an emotional issue for all of us, that we that can vote. But economy, meaning jobs or gas prices, are like really, really important for our people and health and education as well. But number one is, is economy. Okay. Is that something that all of you are seeing around the country? Um, who, who wants to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, if I can chime in on that. Uh, so I totally agree, and I think that also along with that is that she mentioned uh, education, for example. I, I think it's very important to, to the community, but uh, to just the general American public, that we see these, um, these issues in terms of their economic impact. And so education isn't just about education. If we want a stable, uh, long-lasting, uh, developing economy, then you have to take education into account in the long term because you have to be able to train people to come out and be productive, active citizens and uh, also creative, um, critical thinking uh, members of the workforce. Okay. Um, in considering the, the poor approval rating that both Congress and the administration have now among voters, uh, there's a lot of talk uh, particularly among, among Latinos, that are suggesting that Latino voters are not going to participate in this election. What are your thoughts on that, on the current climate and the impact on participation? Uh, this Arturo, I'd like to take that question on. Sure. Go ahead, Arturo. Yes. So, <clears throat> I think that the the way Congress is, is being rated by the public, and not just by Latinos, but by the entire public, does have an effect on the interests of, of voters overall to participate. But when you look at the growth of the Latino electorate, how many Latinos have entered uh, the electorate since uh, 2008, uh, we will have a significant increase of Latino voters over the last presidential election. We had 9.7 million Latinos vote in 2008. We project 12.2 million in 2012. Part of that is, again, by the sheer increase of the electorate itself. Now, the challenge we have, those of us on this call and those of us working in the voter engagement field, is to bring Latinos into actually voting. And that doesn't happen just uh, w without full engagement of our community. And I think that's a challenge and responsibility we have to make sure that the Latino voice is heard in this election. Yeah, this is Clarissa from CLR, if I may. Yes, yeah, sure. Go ahead, Clarissa. I think that, you know, in, in many ways, this may seem like a counterintuitive moment, and it's not just for Latinos, as, as Arturo said. There is a great deal of discontent in our country with the performance of our elected officials. And I think that Latinos are definitely feeling that because... As Arturo said, there is a great I'm deal I'm getting a little bit of feedback, but um, anyway, the, the, the point here being that Latinos, like the rest of the, uh, the country, are suffering from the inaction in Congress in many state legislatures to actually put real solutions on the table, and, and a lot of the problems we have require real legislative solutions. But at the same time that that mood is there, and, what could, and one could say, based on the facts, it could be a very logic uh, behavior that people see home. I'm actually encouraged by what we saw in 2010. And, like, you know, the many elections 
in an election eve poll that we did of Latino voters when we were asking them did they come out more motivated to support the candidate of their choice or to support the Latino community, a plurality of Latino voters said they came out to support their community. And that is exactly where we're at. It's a moment in time where we have to take a stand and vote more than for any candidate is really to vote for respect and continue to be engaged so that we hold accountable to everyone. Okay. Um, may, may I say something? Um, according to our polls, Univision polls, in, uh, in November and in January, enthusiasm is lower than it is. Is everybody getting the same the same uh, feedback that I'm having? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Can we do something about it? Yes. I'm going to mute all the other computers. So go ahead. Continue talking. Okay. According to our polls, when it was imposed in November and January, enthusiasm is lower than in 2008. But with all of the discussions about immigration during these primaries, I think that interest uh, became higher, right? That doesn't mean that if the, that interest is going to represent more voters. We don't know. That's why we all are here tonight, trying to bring more voters, right? Uh, became higher. Exactly. So, um, you know, they, in this control, uh, this election, there's a, a lot of controversy going on. Uh, Obviously, immigration plays a central role in the uh, immigration reform and immigration and the failure to pass the comprehensive immigration reform. So, what challenge do you think this is going to provide? Both the Republican um, nominee, the challenger, and also President Obama. Now that we're moving forward um, in trying to mobilize the Latino vote. Any anyone would like to take that one? Well, actually, it was quite. Didn't quite understand the question. I think you were talking about the immigration issue and how that's going to affect Latino like, you know, voter turnout. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, well, there are certainly there certainly is a significant segment of the Latino electorate that is following immigration policy very closely. Those particularly who are naturalized citizens, those who have family members who are immigrants, whether they be documented or undocumented, all of them have a stake in fixing our broken immigration yes. system, and they're following yes. those developments very closely. But for the entire Latino electorate, what's very uh, important is how candidates and campaigns talk immigrants about immigration and talk about immigrants. Those who uh, speak about immigrants in a way that uh, blames them for the recession or blames them for the economy and blames them for the ills of society and uh, promote anti-immigrant uh, legislation and proposals, uh, that has been what has been motivating many Latinos to actually participate because of the anger that it has been generated. Um, so I think candidates, be they Republican or Democrat, need to be very careful about how they talk about this issue in a way that does not turn away or turn off or turn Latinos uh, away from them in a way that's going to hurt their campaigns. I totally agree, Arturo. I think like at this point, we need more than a message. It's, it's beyond the message. We need to hear a real program that is going to benefit all of us. As I said before, for us that we can vote is an emotional issue immigration, but we all know someone or somebody or in our family we have someone that doesn't have documents. So we are all interested in, in listening to more than a message. It's beyond that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now, Clarissa, I know that you, that you work in immigration. I would really like to hear what you have to say about this. Do you think there is a Clarissa, <laughs> can you hear? Clarissa, I know that you that you work. It's just a little delay. Beyond the immigration. We can hear Clarissa, right? Yeah, I think there might be. Um, her computer might be a little slow. So let's let's continue the, the conversation here and then um, 
Clarissa is going to check on her computer to see what, what's going on. Um, this, I have a question here for Arturo. And Arturo, we, we have touched upon the fact that Latinos have historically and are poised to, again, play a decisive role in many of the swing states this year. How else do you see Latinos having an impact, both on the national and on the local landscapes? Well, I, I think there has been too much attention placed on this being an election only about the presidency in the White House. In fact, this is the first election that we're having after the 2010 census and after redistricting. And there will be many down-ballot races for Congress and for state legislatures where we're seeing mobilization on a local level they're trying to engage Latinos so that we can increase the number of accountable elected officials both in the Congress and in state legislatures. We know we have two new opportunity districts in Texas, at least two new opportunity districts for Congress in California, an opportunity for Latinos to be influential in a new district in Las Vegas and Central Florida and in, uh, in New York City as well. Uh, and then countless of other state legislative districts. So while this is a very important race at a federal level, it is equally important at the local level for con Congress, but also for state legislatures. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're in the country, this question is for everyone that, that wants to, um, to answer it. Where in the country are we seeing the most growth in voter participation? Are there, are, is this in those places where the um, in, the, in the places where Latinos uh, are participating less, uh, what do you well, contribute to I, that? Ironically, you know, the, we're projecting again a 26% 26 26 increase of Latino voters from 2008 to 2012. The two states that we project will have the largest increase proportionally of Latino voters are California and Florida. Uh, uh, we anticipate California will have a 33% increase in Latino voters, similarly in Florida. Uh, Florida is going to be a key swing state. I think the Latino vote will absolutely be decisive in that state and uh, will have an opportunity for his Latinos in Florida to really determine the future direction of the country. Mm -hmm. I can um, you know, add on to that just slightly. Um, something that's interesting here in the Midwest is uh, is the fact is also the fact of the Latino growth. It's, it's not as uh, 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 drastic as in, as in those states, but in states like Ohio, where uh, the, the states are going to be won on the margins, those votes are really important as well. Well, according to, to our studies, 50,000 Latinos are becoming 18 years old every month. And, and I think that's, you know, a, a population that we can or that we actually are doing something to conquer, right, to, to ask them to, to register and vote. And I think that that, that is going to be a, a, uh, an important uh, population that can vote and, and you know, go, go, go outside and vote this year. Yeah. I, I agree. I'm, I'm going to be, um, as, as we mentioned in the beginning, we're going to be taking questions from Twitter, and we have some questions coming in right now. Uh, so I have the first question here. This question is from uh, Family Reunite, and his question is, if someone wants to push for change in our immigration laws, for example, in the Visas and in the Family Reunification Act, what can a person do about this? Anybody wants to take that one? I'm waiting for Clarissa to take this question, so I think she's <laughs> the best position. Clarissa, would you like to take this question? Well, I'm trying to figure, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me now? Okay. All right. We're sorry, we were fidgeting with the sound <laughs> over here. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, the question is, if somebody wants to... Um, to push for change in our immigration laws, what do what can they do? What can they do about it? There's actually an incredible number of things that people can do, um, and some of them are very, very personal steps that we can take from the point of view of if we are an eligible immigrant becoming a citizen, if we are a citizen becoming a voter. But even if we don't have the ability to do those things, 
We can volunteer to work with the community organizations in our area that are helping people become citizens or become voters or educating our community so we become accountable. Um, not we become accountable, so elected officials become accountable to those who they represent. And also very importantly, particularly given the environment, such toxic environment that is not only anti-immigrant, it's anti-Latino. And in light of the, the Arizona case and whatever the Supreme Court may do, I think one area where we can all collaborate together is to educate our communities better so that we can defend our rights and we can defend against racial profiling, which unfortunately it is the discussion taking place nationwide under the cloak of immigration. But I think that Latinos have wised up to the fact that there might be a lot of talk about immigration, but this is really a proxy for a conversation about Latinos and how we are regarded in this country. I definitely agree. And in that same vein, there's a lot of talks right now um, and a lot of studies that come out all the time about how Latinos are disproportionately affected by the economic downturn, for example, and um, the foreclosure crisis and the unemployment rates. Um, how do you see the candidates on both sides of the aisle addressing these challenges? Well, I actually, this is Arturo, I actually don't think the candidates are sufficiently addressing That's those right. issues through a Latino lens. They're talking about those issues to the general public, uh, pop population and the general electorate, but they're not addressing those issues as if they were speaking to Latino voters. And that's where I think both political parties and all of the candidates are falling short at the moment. They need to get out there and listen to what's on the mind of Latino voters, and they need to speak to them directly about the issues they care about which are the ones we've been talking about here. The economy, the foreclosure crisis, access to quality health care, a quality education, safe streets, safe communities. That's what Latino voters are, are, have on their mind. They're waiting to hear about that from the candidates themselves. Mm -hmm. Which are the, the issues that affect everyone. Um, and I, Liliana, um, I, I saw you raising your hand. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you can hear me, but one of the things that I wanted to add is that not only do the elected officials need to hear about the concerns that matter most to Latinos, and they're the ones that we highlighted here, but we as a Latino community need to make our voice heard and let elected officials know where we stand on these issues and what issues matter most to us. Um, in addition to voicing our concerns with elected officials, one of the strongest message we can send is by turning out and voting on the day of the election and making sure that the officials that we help to elect are issue, or excuse me, candidates that are um, in tune to what the Latino community needs are. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And uh, with all of these, these talk about the different issues that are affecting Latinos, you know, the economic issues, the immigration issues, they're all important things. How do you think all of those things will play out at the elections, uh, as the election season unfolds? Um, so if I could chime in on that one, uh, you know, I think that a lot depends on whether or not the economy continues to increase and proportionately for, uh, for Latinos as well, not just the general population, but specifically with Latinos. Um, and, and on the economic uh, side of things, it's also about, you know, are the elected officials at the national level uh, getting in touch with the community members? So, for example, uh, myself, uh, the, the Cincinnati Hispanic Chamber president, and a few other people held a meeting with Senator Sherrod Brown, uh, Brown and his, his uh, policymakers and uh, policy writer, and you know we expressed that the idea of economic growth from the Latino perspective is that we're growing, we're, we're business entrepreneurs, and small business to us is really micro business. So our businesses have between one, five, eight people as employees, including the owners, um, not what is technically on the books of small business, which is like 60 employees or, uh, or, or less or, or more, and uh, it's right around 60 employees. And that doesn't work for you know, the mom and pop shops that we're opening all across the country. And so in terms of understanding 
uh, the economic growth from the Latino perspective, those policymakers have to get in touch with us, and, and, and some are and some aren't, uh, but it's definitely, as uh, Arturo has pointed out, um, they can do better on this front. Yeah, and Leo, now that, that um, you're, you have the mic, so to speak, um, I know that you have written about this, and I and I would really like to hear your your um, perspective on it. Do you think the recent Supreme Court decision, um, or the, you know, the decision that they're supposed to be making on the constitutionality of the Arizona law, is, how do you think that's going to impact the Latino votes in November? Sure. Um, so I mean, yeah, I think we're all hopeful that um, the Supreme Court will maintain the lower court's um, ruling on this. But if worst, you know, worst case scenario, I mean, I think Arturo said this as well, when, uh, when, when elected officials go negative, particularly on um, immigration, that has the tendency to elevate the importance of that issue uh, greatly, like it skyrockets right to the top. Uh, whereas otherwise, uh, it's things like education, uh, the economy, jobs, uh, things like that. Um, so it'll be interesting to see uh, if the Supreme Court upholds the Arizona law, and you know, I think a lot of us are expecting if that occurs that there will be a, a, a proliferation of these anti-immigrant uh, uh, forms of legislation across the country, how that will affect um, voter turnout. My sense is, as in Arizona, uh, that it will solidify the Latino bloc against those who are putting those laws forward. Um, if, that, if the trajectory holds, uh, the, those who are doing that law is the Republican side of the aisle. So you we know, can make conclusions from there. OK. Um, well, I, I'm going to take another question from Twitter. Um, we're going, we're getting a lot of them. Um, what are the chances of getting the Dream Act passed in a school version? Anybody would like to? Take um, I, th I think that at one point, uh, our population they need to see more a real, a real plan for for Dream Act. Dream Act, for example, last year became what we call La Joya de la Corona, right? And it was like the topic all over the news. Uh, they were talking about Dream Act, but Dream Act how? And I think our people is more aware of what the, the topics are, what they need are, and what, you know, what they really need them to do for us, for our community. And, and I don't think it's going to be easy for any of them to, to reach out our community for, um, on what we all need. What I'm constantly hearing, which is problematic for immigration and for all the other issues that our community cares about, is that this year we can expect to see much progress out of Congress on any of the issues that really, really require some kind of legislative intervention. And the DREAM Act is, seems to be caught in this paralysis that has become the modus operandi of Congress. And frankly, again, on immigration, it's been a huge problem. The fate of immigration issues, whether it is immigration reform or the DREAM Act or Ag Jobs, have always required collaboration between the two parties. Yes, a bigger number on the Democratic side and a, a, a small number on the Republican side, but those two working together and unfortunately, over the last several years, with the toxic nature of the immigration debate, we have seen stronger at the table. This year, with Senator Rubio kind of stepping into that space and talking about the DREAM Act, we definitely welcome his leadership, particularly in calling members of his party to tone down the anti-immigrant and anti-Latino rhetoric. We think that that needs to be recognized and applauded. And as he thinks about what proposal to introduce that his party may rally, or my, may rally around, one of the things that we, uh, that, that we remind everyone of is that a policy that would create a generation of nationless children or a generation of second-class citizens is something that we don't aspire to and that we know 
Senator Rubio understands as a country we need to do better then. At the same time, we hope that he's able to convince the members of his party to come to the table and that if he can bring Leader Boehner and uh, Senate Leader, Senate Major, uh, Majority, Minority Leader McConnell to the table, we could really see this through. Yeah, how, how far can, can he go with this proposal of Dream Act or, or this idea because it's not a proposal? How far can he go? Uh, at one point, he's going he's gonna to have to balance among pleasing Latinos and pleasing his party, right? That is something that two parties are not going like, to approve well, those, like that easy. Those two things should not be mutually exclusive because the fact That's is right. that either political party, if they want to remain relevant in American politics, they're going to need Latinos as part of their future strategy. Democrats need Latinos. Republicans will be Latinos. Any political party who ignores Latinos or pushes them away will ultimately be the permanent minority party in this country. Yeah. So do we, do we have to support Rubio's version of the DREAM Act in order to give it a higher percentage of, of possibility of coming through? Well, I think one of the first things we need to do is understand exactly what is Senator Rubio's proposal. Uh, I've heard some descriptions of it, but I haven't heard it from the Senator himself. I think he deserves an opportunity for all of us to first understand exactly what he's proposing before we pass judgment on what his version of the DREAM Act will be. Okay. Well, now I, I have a question um, directly for Ilya Calderon. Um, in Ilya, you have obviously been following the, the candidates very closely as they ramp up their campaigns. Uh, and we see that both parties are now, um, you know, aggressively, uh, in different degrees of aggression, but they're going after the Latino vote now. They're hiring Latino specialists for their campaigns. Uh, do you think this will help or not? Um, and if not, what is it that they should be doing in order to, to get the message out that will resonate with Latinos? I think it will help as long as it becomes a clear proposal as the time goes by before the election. Um, another thing that can, can be important for us is like, for example, if, if they have working in their campaigns, uh, Latinos, but in key positions, in their inner circle, that is something that we can look at and that is something that, that it is really important for us. Another thing is that they should not be stereotyping, like, are you Latino or Hispanics or according to the, to the pupil, the last pupil that, that um, generated a lot, of, a lot of controversy this weekend on Al Punto, it was, would you, would you prefer to be called Latino or Hispanic or Hispanic Latino or by your own country? And the majority decided that they prefer to be called like Colombian or Salvadorian, Honduran, Venezuelan for their own country. I think they need to be a little more clear on, on the way they are addressing us. Can I weigh in on this one? You know, I don't care what people call themselves. You can call yourself a Latino, a Chicano, a Boricua, Venezolano, Centroamericano, mm -hmm. Cubano, Puerto Ricano. As long as you are participating in our elections and in your communities and you care about the future of your community, that's what we need to focus on. Enough with the labels already. We need to move forward on an agenda for our community. As a community, yeah. Yeah, exactly. and I think where the, parties, where the parties are concerned, frankly, the way that they should figure out, the biggest strategy to approach this community rather than figure out whether they call us Latino, Mexican, if, if they treat us with respect, that would go a long way. That's right. Completely agree with Lettys. If they focus on our needs. Exactly. And what we really need. <laughs> I, I have a question now for, um, for Liliana. And Liliana, we've seen a rise in legislation and regulation of, or of the in, an intent to prevent registration, voter registration and voter fraud. Um, allegedly in an attempt to, to prevent fraud, right? But um, that includes the voter ID requirements, that includes the limitation on third-party registration. How do you see these new laws 
coming into play and how can we or how will the Latino community respond to these things? I mean, right now, it's, it's, I'm outraged. Right. It's a really good question. Thank you for bringing it up. And, you know, um, these new voter ID laws are going to suppress a lot of the Latino vote, but also a lot of the vote for communities of color, elderly, disabled, and the youth. And so one of the best tools that we can arm ourselves with is getting educated on what those voter IDs are, laws are in each particular state. And LULAC, as well as other organizations across the country, have organized community education, community mobilizing campaigns to ensure that Latinos know what these voter ID laws are in their particular states and what they can do to educate others on these particular states. Latinos need to register and they also need to turn out the day of the elections. And the best tool we have to ensure that Latinos and our voices are represented the day of is to get educated. Anybody? You know, that's one, one of the things to keep in mind about these voter suppression laws is that they're exactly a response to the fact that the Latino vote is having an effect. Uh, we would not be uh, under attack. The Latino vote would not be under attack if the Latino vote were not in itself having an impact across this country. So the reason these voter suppression laws are being enacted is to try to turn the clock back on Latino political empowerment. But it really is upon us to work against these laws, but more importantly ensure that Latino voters are fully educated about their rights because the only way we can ensure that a voter's rights are not denied is if that voter is fully informed about his or her rights when they go into the polling booth. You know, and, and here in Ohio, uh, we actually, and so I agree with Arturo mostly, but this is also not just about the Latino vote and turning back the clock on just Latinos. This is about uh, a pushback against uh, African American populations, young voters, uh, college educated voters, urban voters. Um, here in Ohio, for example, uh, we have a relatively small percentage of the population uh, and so uh, this attempt was made to restrict the vote here in Ohio. And we were able to push back and get it on the ballot. It blocked, which actually blocked it uh, last year, um, as well as uh, through this, this election cycle. Uh, and and so, so part of it is the groundwork, right? Latinos also have to be engaged uh, so that we can be in the right place in the right time. And I was actually uh, one of the main uh, signatories to that to the petition drive that got it on the ballot, and this isn't just a partisan issue either, because the other Latino that was a main signatory uh, from the Cleveland area, I'm from Cincinnati, uh, is a Republican. So this is a this is a bipartisan issue, but one clearly that the Latino community, African American community, and urban folks see as one that affects all of us. And you can push back on it. I think that's important to note too. Can't, we can't stop this from happening before the, before the polls, before we get I, I agree. I agree with that, but voter suppression laws that specifically are asking for people to prove their citizenship are directly uh, directed towards Latinos and other communities of immigrant backgrounds. So yeah. while, yes, these suppression laws are designed to a broader audience, so let's be clear, some of them are specifically targeting Latino voters. And what, what can we do about that? I, it, I mean, are we, are we completely powerless when it comes to, to stopping these laws? Is, is there anything that can be done about no, it? And as, a, as I just said, you can use that on these laws, and, and that's what we did here in Ohio. Uh, Ohio is one of the most politically important states in the country, and, uh, and that's why the voter suppression laws were put in place here, and, and we blocked them through 2012. It takes organization. It takes a clear effort to uh, be up to date and be informed, like has been said, but you know, it's not a, it's not a losing battle. It's there's three losing. there's three things that can be done. Um, I think a couple of them have been talked about. Obviously, we need to make sure that when legislators start talking about uh, introducing bills to do these laws, that we challenge their premise. Every single state that has passed a voter ID or similar law 
has argued that they are doing it to prevent voter fraud, and none of them have been able to produce compelling evidence of any kind that that problem exists. So we need to continue to do battle in the legislative houses to make sure that a bill doesn't go through or that if, it's ha if it has gone through that we come back and try to undo that damage because at the end of the day the damage is for United States citizens and, their, and preventing them from voting. But the other thing that we can do as well is we already know what the motivation is and part of the motivation is that you know, look, in our community among Latinos, our problem is not that too many people are voting or that they're voting too much. The problem is that not enough of us are voting. So we need to make sure and be proactive that at the same time that we're doing the legal and legislative battles to overturn these laws, we're also educating our community so that they're prepared to bring whatever they need to bring with them to that election day so that they do not get turned away. And the, the, the great thing about that is that there's so many of our organizations at the national level that as each of us have our own voter engagement campaigns, we're also coming together to make sure that, you know, we're coordinating our work and we reach as many Latinos as we can, all working and coordinating that labor of love. Um, and we have, thanks to the tireless work that Naleo has done for so many years, a bilingual hotline that people can call, 1-888-BAY-VOTA, where you can get information not only about where you go to vote, but what are some of the requirements. We also can get information to people through text messaging and through our website. So I think that it's about making sure that people are prepared and nobody's going to take that right away from them. That's a perfect leeway right. to the next question, Clarissa. And thank you for mentioning Ya es Hora. Uh, we're we're um, the newest partners to the whole campaign, and, and we are so proud that so many great organizations are coming together to work on this um, such such an important issue. Um, so we we've been talking about the roles of the traditional candidates, the issues in the campaign. We've been talking about you know. Um, all the things that, that need to be done in certain ways, but what are what are um, what do we need to do as organizations? As uh, let's let's put ourselves into into the, as an example, uh, what do we need to be doing to ensure that Latinos turn out in historic numbers this November? I think that what one of our <laughs> greatest goals is convince them in trying to tell them that their vote counts because most of them they don't they don't register and vote because they think they're not going to be heard that their voice doesn't count and it does and that's a part of the campaign for example with Univision that registra TV y vota because it is important to uh, first of all this is a democratic country and and that's a privilege that we all have second that we don't have any right to say anything to protest or, or to support our own community if we don't go out and vote and and who is going to make decisions for us if we don't we don't participate in the in this process so that's that's i think that's one of our biggest goals but it's, it's nice to know that we are all working uh, to to get there to 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 bring the people out and register and vote and wh what can other organizations who are not traditionally involved in the voting effort, what can they do to help the larger effort that all of these organizations are trying to, to bring together? Well, we well, are... I, CLR, you know, we are have, sorry, go ahead, Arturo. Ladies <laughs> um, first, Clarissa. Go, go for it. Uh, thank I'll follow you. Um, well, that's a great point because I think sometimes, um, you know, there's a sense that only if you do this kind of electoral work you are able to do it. And I'm really proud of the fact that there is so much interest in the Latino community and from folks who don't do this work every day. Um, we at NCLR are, are an umbrella of Latino or Latino serving organizations. Some of them are schools, some of them are community health clinics, some of them are research centers. And we actually have a program where we work in partnership with these organizations so they can make the opportunity to register available to the people they serve, whether it's a community health clinic, 
whether it is an organization that works with parents and, and training parents, whether it is even a home ownership counseling service. And so there's a lot of folks that are putting their granito de arena. And at the same time, I think we're getting smarter and smarter about how to provide different mechanisms for people to do it. So I mentioned the bilingual hotline. We are all developing uh, web portals so that people can also register in line. And we also can get information to people from text messaging. So if folks call uh, text vote or vota, depending what's your language preference, to 62571, you can also get information by text message. And at the end of the day, I think that energy and that collaboration and that buzz is something that was crucial to the wave of eligible immigrants that decided to become citizens in 2007. And it's crucial to shifting the environment so that every election cycle more and more Latinos vote. Last but not least, I think it's also important to be honest. And a lot of times we get excited about elections and talk about them like if an action on that day is going to change everything. I think we've all learned um, the hard way that an election is a means to an end. It's not the end itself. We need to show up on that day and we need to keep showing up and holding feet to the fire so that folks are responsible regardless of whether we voted for them or not, because at the end of the day, they have to represent the constituencies, the constituencies in their districts. Mm -hmm. That's true. So Arturo, you want to say anything about that? Well, uh, I would encourage organizations that do not necessarily have voter engagement as part of their portfolio or civic engagement in general, that they can actually participate in the Yes Ora campaign, contact us here at Naleo, contact folks at NCLR and Mi Familia Vota. We all have resources that we have developed already that are designed for other organizations to, to use. So there's no need to recreate the wheel, but rather take advantage of the resources that have been developed, leverage them, because if we all put our resources together and we all work together, we can be much greater than just uh, elements of the whole. And that's what we need to do in terms of voter engagement. We all have an individual responsibility to register and to vote but we have a responsibility to make sure that everybody within our own networks also registers and votes. And that's really what ultimately it will take. It will take everybody's personal responsibility to engage in the process and engage others. Um, I'm, I'm getting a lot of questions from Twitter. Some of them you already are answering before we actually take them. But one of the questions that, um, that we got from the Google Plus channel actually is, um, how can we engage young Latino voters, which are, you know, as we mentioned in the beginning, some of the most active groups um, in the electoral pool? Well, if I can take a minute here to talk about what LULAC is doing to engage the Latino community and mobilize them. One of the uh, target populations that we're working with is with our LULAC youth members, and we are working with colleges and universities and we are not only educating our youth around um, how to register to vote, um, the importance of doing the advocacy work and mobilizing at the ground level, but at the same time, we're encouraging them to spread the word and engage their friends, their colleagues, uh, their family, their neighbors, so that they can join the movement because this is something, as some of my other colleagues on this um, uh, conversation have been discussing that we need to work together so that we can make our issues stand out and so that they can get addressed. I think, um, you know, frankly, uh, the, the social media is something that our Latino youth and the Latino community at large, but Latino youth definitely thrive in. And I, I I think her computer froze again. Mm. So she'll, she'll jump back in when she's um, ready. So now that we're nearing the end of the, of the chat, so I really want um, for all of you to tell me, what is the best way for people out there to get involved in our, the Our young generations are being politicized by this environment of anti-immigrant anti and anti in our rhetoric and they are taking charge and taking leadership 
in actually being at the forefront of defending and standing up for their families and their communities. And I think this is going to be such a great moment for really generating a culture of activism much, much more intense in our Latino community. And then to answer your question, uh, I would encourage everybody to visit the website yasora.info, Y-A-V-A-H-O-R-A dot I-N-F-O. There you can get information about how you can participate, how you can volunteer, whether it's helping somebody to become a citizen or encouraging uh, folks to register to vote and to vote. There are opportunities there to get involved. There's also information to be shared. It is completely bilingual. And so visit yasora.info and get involved. We need everybody to take personal responsibility in this election. Well, um, so now that we're, we're nearing the, the end of the chat, what would be the most important message that you want to send to the Latino community that is watching out there? You know, I'll, I'll start again. <laughs> <laughs> the future, the future, of this country, <laughs> the future of this country depends on the success of the Latino community. You know, we will be electing more Latinos and Latinas to local, state, and federal office. Uh, we need to, as a community, uh, be able to demonstrate that we also have the talent to provide leadership for America and to make sure America remains a global leader. Because ultimately, this isn't just about the Latino community. This is about our nation. This is about the, the future of our society. We have a key role to play as Latinos and Latinas as leaders. It begins by participating, and it continues by being engaged over the long term. Nothing happens with a single election, as Palladisa mentioned earlier. It happens with sustained participation and by demonstrating leadership. Yeah. Anyone else want to take it? In part, you know, I'm going to repeat what Arturo just said, but uh, exactly. My message is to the, what, what we call the grass top leadership of communities all around the country that have the capacity to uh, meet with their uh, congresspersons, to meet with their city councils, to meet with their mayors, as well as those are the folks that are in touch with the people uh, mm -hmm. at the grassroots level in, in the communities all around the country, and be able to to organize, uh, to educate, uh, going both directions. Uh, that's something that's super important. I don't think it happens currently. I think that, uh, as Arturo said, I see, and I think of the Latino community, I think of uh, our community as one of the great hopes of this country uh, moving forward in, in this century. And uh, we have to own that responsibility uh, and really seek to educate our young people, educate uh, everyday folks in the community, but also engage with our locally elected officials and educate them as well. Uh, and, and I think that a lot can come out of that collaborative effort. I think that our community, I agree with both of you, and I also want to add that our community needs to demand more than a message from the candidates. And to do that, they need to be educated. And they have all the sites that you guys have mentioned for uh, uh, for, for information about the elections, get more involved. Go out there in your community. Go ask questions. Um, don't be just like they're waiting for someone to, to decide for you. I think that we all need, we have a great opportunity here to learn in all the sites, websites, and to get informed in the noticieros and, and go there, register, and vote. That's the only way our vote is going to count and we are going to become leaders and, and we are, are going to get more benefits for our community one day. And if I could just add that it's not just important to turn out and vote in these presidential and congressional elections, it's important to keep the momentum and to have a sustained um, way of getting involved, to have that open dialogue with elected officials, community leaders, families, youth, you know, members that are part of different segments of the community so that we can continue to have a role in determining the future of this country because it's something that impacts us all and we need to definitely get educated on the issues but get educated on how to communicate with elected officials and other leaders as well. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I, I think everybody talked about how important our participation in the election is. Um, 
the thing that keeps me going is the knowledge that um, our community, we, we a, lot, a lot of times talk about what we need and, and it is important and a lot of the advocacy work that we do at NCLR is about addressing those things. Um, but sometimes it's also important to remember how much our community offers. We are incredibly resilient, um, our parents, our kids, we can do so much with so little and we are definitely going to be the engine that drives the future American workforce. We're going to be future leaders of this country. I'm also greatly encouraged by the fact that the United States is a country of mutts and Latinos are mutts. We are Asian, <laughs> Black, American, <laughs> Native. I mean, we are everything. And so in a way, we already embody what America is becoming and what America aspires to be. And I agree with Arturo, we need to be prepared to be leaders in that space. And every little step we take along the way helps. So we cannot wait for elected officials or parties to give us the respect that our community has earned. We need to command it. And election is not the end all, but it is one tool that we have, and we ought to use it. Thank you. Well, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, so I want to also say something else. And I know I'm not one of the panelists, but um, I want to I, I do want to take the opportunity message to the community that is watching. We're obviously the ones that have access to all of this technology. And we can do good things, you know, like a hangout on air that is live stream and all of these things. But there's so many of us out there who don't have access to this technology and the, these resources that are that are available for all of us. So I think part of the responsibility that we have as Latinos who, who are in social media is to share those resources with the people who don't have it. You know, share the number for Jais Ora. You know, to tell people that the Univision site has resources in Spanish, that NCLR is doing work to help the Latino community, that Naleo and LULAC and all of these organizations are doing great work and that all of these resources are in Spanish. And that's, um, you know, what better message to finish this, this chat than we, you know, telling people to get off the couch, go register in the next elections, but also share information with, with your people out there. Um, I, I would like to thank all of you for taking the time. Thank you, Arturo. Thank you, Liliana. Thank you, Leo. And thank you, uh, Marisa. Thank you, Ilya, for taking the time for uh, you know to be with us tonight. Um, I wanna thank you for being groundbreakers in this new space. Um, this is the first time that this is going on for our community. This is the first in a series of talks that we're gonna be doing, talking about different things. So I will be very happy to welcome welcome you all again uh, in future chats um, and you know thank you for all the work that you do to help our community very powerful message going out tonight and I hope that people hit it um, so before we wrap up I want to just do a little housekeeping reminder that this whole discussion is going to be available on the Google Plus Latissim channel uh, and it's also going to be available uh, on the YouTube Latissim National account. So uh, I want to thank all of you who are out there watching us. Thank you so much for tuning in. And um, I see you at the next Hangout. Have a great night. It was a pleasure. Bye. 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 Bye.